Once a beacon of prosperity in South America, Venezuela has experienced hyperinflation, scarcity, and economic decline. All of this has recently built up to the elections that it held this year and how unsatisfied people were. But how did Venezuela, a country extremely rich in oil, get into this situation? It seems like a country that has that many resources shouldn't be experiencing all of this economic trouble. So what happened? Where did it go wrong? Let me explain. Venezuela used to be among the richest countries in South America by GDP per capita, and that was for a very good reason. Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. Estimates show that Venezuela has around 18% of all proven global reserves as of 2020, more than Russia or Saudi Arabia, which is an insane amount, especially for its size. It's a country rich in natural resources. So then, what happened that caused Venezuela to enter an economic crisis? Well, it comes down to five components. The first one is its oil dependency. For over a century, Venezuela has been extracting oil, and oil has played a big part in the country's development. But the reliance on oil came with some big downsides. The first is a phenomenon called Dutch disease. This is when the popularity of a main export of a country, in Venezuela's case oil, causes the country's currency to appreciate. This means that the country's other exports become more expensive on the global market, leading to those exports suffering. The term Dutch disease was coined in 1977 when the Netherlands had this problem with natural gas. So now let me give you an example to make it a bit clearer. Let's say one US dollar buys you 40 Venezuelan bolivars, which is the price of a Venezuelan pineapple. But since Venezuela is exporting a lot of oil, the price of bolivars in terms of dollars rises because more people need bolivars to buy the oil. So the exchange rate becomes 20 bolivars for every dollar. This means that to buy the 40 bolivar pineapple, you now need two dollars instead of one. So, Venezuelan pineapples become more expensive for people outside Venezuela, so less people buy them. This happens with all Venezuelan exports other than oil. You can see why the rest of the export economy suffers. While an appreciation of the Venezuelan currency is bad for exports, it's good for imports. The stronger currency means that imports essentially become cheaper for Venezuelans relative to local goods. If Venezuelans buy imports rather than locally produced goods, local production becomes discouraged and eventually fades away. This becomes a big problem when the price of oil falls and the bolivar weakens, because then importing goods is much more expensive and the country no longer has established local producers to rely upon. In fact, the sharp decline in global oil prices in 2014 significantly reduced the country's income, since oil accounted for nearly 95% of export earnings. This loss in revenue exposed the vulnerabilities of an economy heavily dependent on one single export. And this is where the next component of the crisis comes in, economic mismanagement. Instead of investing in other sectors to build a more balanced economic foundation, Venezuela doubled down on oil as the cornerstone of its prosperity and riches. It had failed to diversify its economy, relying almost exclusively on oil exports to fund government spending and social programs. This dependency meant that when oil prices fell, the government had insufficient revenue to maintain its budget, leading to severe fiscal deficits. To bridge this fiscal gap, the government resorted to printing money, a move that led to hyperinflation and eroded the value of the bolivar. As inflation spiraled out of control, the purchasing power of Venezuelans plummeted, further deepening the crisis. At the highest point, the Venezuelan bolivar experienced an insane annual equivalent inflation of 344,509.5% in February 2019. One way the government tried to stabilize the currency was by artificially overvaluing the bolivar. In essence, the official exchange rate set by the state was made unrealistically high. In 2023, the currency was valued five to six times higher than its actual value when compared to the dollar. This meant that buying bolivars with foreign currency, like dollars, officially got you much less money than if you would have exchanged through the black market. But this difference in valuation of the currency encouraged corruption and arbitrage, as individuals and companies with access to dollars at the official rate could trade between the official and black market for substantial profits. In a further effort to curb inflation and protect consumers, the government implemented strict price controls on essential goods. However, these controls backfired by discouraging production and leading to widespread shortages. 
producers could not cover their costs, resulting in a decreased supply of goods such as food and medicine. Similarly, subsidies intended to make essentials affordable instead strained the national budget and amplified the fiscal crisis. Tied to the economic mismanagement lies the third factor in the crisis, politics. The presidency of Hugo Chavez marked a shift towards a more authoritarian form of governance in Venezuela. And after his passing in 2013, Nicolas Maduro continued and intensified these policies, further eroding democratic norms and entrenching authoritarianism. This centralization of power allowed for the unchecked implementation of economically damaging policies and limited accountability. Chavez, over the course of a decade, nationalized many sectors of the economy, from land to milk production to cement factories and to entire buildings. And while this nationalization might have been well-intentioned to empower the country, it resulted in companies running inefficiently and effectively producing less. The oil industry also suffered from this inefficiency, even though it had already been nationalized since 1976 through the funding of Petroleos de Venezuela. Overall, funds that could have been used to stabilize the economy were simply wasted, weakening public trust and undermining efforts to reform the dysfunctional system. Because of this authoritarianism in Venezuelan politics, the fourth component of the crisis followed. Sanctions Key events under Nicolas Maduro's government, such as the controversial 2018 presidential elections and the government's violent crackdown on protests, drew widespread condemnation and with it, sanctions. The primary goals of these measures were to weaken the Maduro administration's grip on power and force a return to democratic governance. The sanctions regime against Venezuela has included a variety of targeted measures aimed both at the economy and key individuals within the regime. For example, financial sanctions restricted Venezuela's access to international financial markets, limiting the government's ability to refinance debt and conduct financial transactions. This effectively cut off the government from essential resources needed to stabilize the economy. But an arguably even more impactful type of sanction were sanctions on oil exports, given that oil is a lifeline of Venezuela's economy. These sanctions included prohibiting the purchase of Venezuelan oil by US companies, freezing the assets of the National Petroleos de Venezuela oil company, and restricting the ability of international companies to do business with the Venezuelan oil industry. Remember how dependent Venezuela is on oil? This was a big blow to their economy. Now that you have a better idea of the extent of the economic crisis, it's easy to see how the fifth component manifests, namely social issues. The insufficient quantities of basic goods in Venezuela because of the economic mismanagement and sanctions led to food insecurity, the collapse of healthcare, and overall worse living conditions. Malnutrition rates rose sharply, with children and vulnerable populations affected the most. The healthcare system approached a state of collapse, with hospitals lacking essential medicines, supplies, and equipment. These conditions triggered one of the largest migration crises in history, with over 7 million Venezuelans leaving to look for security and better opportunities. The migration crisis has also led to a significant brain drain, with many skilled professionals, including doctors, engineers, and teachers, leaving the country. This loss of human capital further weakened Venezuela's ability to rebuild its economy and social services. And while Venezuela's situation might sound like a depressing and pessimistic story, there's some hope. It no longer faces hyperinflation, and most of Venezuela's economy has been dollarized. More than 70% of all retail transactions are in US dollars, which for the moment brings stability. Artificial exchange rates are also now a thing of the past, and you can freely and openly buy, sell, and deposit foreign currency, which used to be illegal. While there are still public workers left behind because they're paid in bolivars instead of dollars, and there's a lot more to be improved, Venezuela is doing better and isn't in as bad of a situation as it was before. The US even agreed to lift sanctions as long as it would hold democratic and fair presidential elections. In the recent elections on the 28th of July, Maduro seemed to achieve a 51% majority vote, but that did not come without allegations of falsifying the results. What is certain is that the next leader of Venezuela has the challenging and demanding task of rebuilding its economy.